From CBS News headquarters in New York, this is the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. Today, legalized abortions. The majority in cases from Texas and Georgia said that the decision to end a pregnancy during the first three months belongs to the woman and her doctor, not the government. Thus, the anti-abortion laws of 46 states were rendered unconstitutional. And be assured, be assured, along with you, we will not grow weary. We will not rest until we restore a culture of life in America for ourselves and our posterity. How did you first get involved with this court case, Roe vs. Wade? Uh, I was working at the University of Texas School of Law for one of the professors, and a group of mostly women and I were having coffee, and the leader of that group, a woman named Judy Smith, began to talk to me about the need to get the anti-abortion laws in Texas wiped out. So that led to a conversation about the possibility of a lawsuit to challenge the Texas anti-abortion statute. The statute at that time was that all abortion was illegal except to save the life of the woman. But nobody knew what, quote, to save the life of the woman, quote, meant. So doctors were generally afraid to do any abortions. During this time period, it was only acceptable for women to be pregnant if they were married. This belief derived from the opinions and credence of various religious groups. If a woman was not married and became pregnant, it was shameful for the family. People would treat these women as strangers and would separate them from society. This created a common fear for women of becoming neglected, abandoned, and jilted by the people they loved. So many innocent women became outcasts. They had been banished from their schools and homes. They were soon to give birth to a child, and rather than being surrounded by caring family members, they were living in institutions among strangers. Before the ruling of the case Roe vs. Wade was decided, women had to go through great lengths to obtain an abortion, which is also known as the expulsion of a fetus from the uterus before it has reached the stage of viability. Approximately 200,000 to 1.2 million illegal abortions were performed in the years between 1950 and 1960, and about 5,000 of those women died in the United States alone each year from the unsafe and unsanitary abortions. When women reported to their doctors about receiving an abortion, the doctors would refuse out of fear of going against the law, so the woman would be forced to go through dangerous procedures in order to receive the treatment needed. Some of these procedures included unbending a steel clothing hanger and manhandling it up a woman's uterus. If the doctor goes within a quarter of an inch of the uterus, he could puncture it and a woman might bleed to death. Women from all over the U.S. would go to foreign countries like Mexico and Sweden to receive abortions, one of them including Sarah Weddington. And that I would do anything I could to see that that was not necessary. When Sarah Weddington was still in law school, she became pregnant. She was afraid that the pregnancy might get in her way of becoming a lawyer and any future she could hold in the business. Because of her prior experience with the methods, women in need of abortion went through she decided to take a stand. What she later came to discover was that one of her classmates, Linda Coffey, would come to have connections to Norma McCorvey, otherwise known as Jane Roe. She's the woman once known only as Jane Roe. We'll hear arguments in number 18, uh, Roe against uh, Wade. The plaintiff in the court case that made abortion legal. McCorvey was a pregnant young troubled woman looking for an abortion for she had previously been denied one from her doctor. She met with a lawyer, Linda Coffey, at an Italian restaurant to discuss the goals they wanted to set for the situation. Coffey called her past classmate from law school, 
Sarah Weddington and asked her to become part of the case. It was a perfect opportunity for Weddington, but she had one major obstacle, or so we thought. Could you tell us a little bit about Wade? Henry Wade was the district attorney of Dallas. He ended up doing something that helped us, although I don't think he meant to do that. If you have a case and the appropriate court rules the law unconstitutional, if it's continuing to be enforced, then the plaintiff's lawyer has a direct appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. Henry Wade the next day had a press conference and ruled it or said he didn't care what any federal court said, he would continue to prosecute, which gave us a direct appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. So we got to the Supreme Court a lot faster. Weddington and Coffey filed for a lawsuit representing Roe in 1970, but they officially started the argument on December 13, 1971. According to Ms. Weddington, this was a very difficult case. If you could describe your experiences with this case in one word, what would it be? Challenging. Because at that point in history, very few women other than lawyers in the Labor Department, the U.S. Labor Department, very few women lawyers had ever argued in the U.S. Supreme Court. But all paid off in the end, for the court issued the ruling on January 22, 1973, with a 7-2 majority vote on the favor of Roe. Weddington originally was informed of her victory through a reporter. She then received a telegram from the Supreme Court formally confirming her victory and was overjoyed by the results of the ruling. The ruling stated that a woman has a right to have an abortion, for it falls in her right to privacy alluded to in the Fourth Amendment. Weddington knew this case would have a dramatic impact on future generations, politics, and societal standards. According to the source Freakonomics, the decrease of the 90s crime rates may be an unintended result of the case Roe v. Wade. The legalization of abortion in the 1970s was one of the primary reasons why crime fell in the 1990s because a whole generation of potentially unwanted children were never born because of the legalization of abortion. And if you fast forward 20 years to the point in time when they were going to be at their peak crime ages, they simply weren't there to do the crime. Even today, the debate over pro-life or pro-choice carries on. As of the year 2017, nearly 60 million abortions were performed. This staggering rate of abortions has challenged many people's views with them including even Norma McCorvey herself. Hello, I'm Norma McCorvey. Today as a born-again Christian and a faithful Catholic, I'm working to reverse Roe. Her views have changed from pro-choice to pro-life. The reason for this transition may be because Norma McCorvey has since created an unbreakable mother-daughter bond with her daughter Emily, who Norma would have aborted. Even though she changed her position, what is most important is that she gave women the right to choose what is best for themselves. This case was one of the major stepping stones climbing up to women's rights. Without this case, who knows where women would be standing today? In the absence of women like Sarah Weddington, Norma McCorvey, Linda Coffey, and so many others who took a stand for women's rights, women would not be able to safely and legally make decisions about their own bodies. Although the fight was very challenging, these females, among others, persevered through the doubt, hatred, and protest to emancipate and liberate women from every race, religion, and cultural background from the shackles of society. Women have these strong ladies to thank for the right to decide for themselves the major decision of having a child. The more I heard them tell the stories of the problems, the more I was willing to try to help them. And now we have a voice. We have a choice. They took a stand. What, what are, are we, we going to stand, stand up for? for?